Hi everyone, it's now six o'clock and I wanted to go ahead and just uh, formally start this session. I'm gonna hand it over to Julia Doe, who is gonna be introducing our scholars and guest artists for this evening. And thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy. Thanks, Jace. Good evening, everybody. I am delighted to see everybody again. I feel like we have much better lighting than we did last time since daylight savings has happened between, between in the last two weeks. Um, thanks so much for joining us as we continue our discussion about the artistic patronage and influence of Madame de Pompadour. So if you were here two weeks ago, we started talking about the 18th century Rococo and particularly the influence of the royal mistress in artistic terms in the pre-revolutionary period. And today what we're gonna be doing is connecting those historical discourses, historical aesthetics to developments in the present day. So thinking about what has been the longer term influence of the aesthetics associated with Madame de Pompadour speaking in music, but here especially in terms of the visual arts. Uh, we're privileged to have back today our three speakers from two weeks ago who I will introduce very briefly. Um, so we'll be hearing today from first from Mark Ledbury, who's Power Professor of Art History and Director of the Power Institute at the University of Sydney. He's the author of, among many other works, a book called Sedan Clothes and the Boundaries of Genre. We're also going to hear from Melissa Hyde, who's a professor and distinguished teaching scholar at the University of Florida, author of Making Up the Rococo, Francois Boucher and His Critics. Uh, and then we also have with us Meredith Martin, who's Associate Professor of Art History at New York University and the Institute of Fine Arts, author of books like The Sun King at Sea and Dairy Queen on the, past, uh, on the Politics of Pastoral Architecture. So our three art historians are going to be uh, giving us about 30 minutes of information on, on these art historical questions, uh, and then we'll enter into conversation with Machine Dazzle, who is working on the costume and artistic design of Opera Lafayette's production this spring. So just a few more words about Machine Dazzle, who we're really excited to have with us today. Uh, Machine Dazzle, who describes himself, is, uh, describes himself as a radical, queer, emotionally driven, instinct-based concept artist and thinker. So he's an artist, costume designer, set designer, singer, songwriter, art director, maker, and all around creative. And he's worked with many from the New York scene and beyond, including Diane von Furstenberg, Cara Delevingne, the Dazzle Dancers, Big Art Group, Opera Philadelphia, and a huge number of other really important collaborations. He's worked with Taylor Mack on projects including The Lily's Revenge, Walk Across America for Mother Earth, and the Pulitzer Prize nominated A 24-Decade History of Popular Music. He's also won all sorts of awards, including a 2017 Bessie Award for Outstanding Visual Design, a 2017 Henry Hughes Design Award, and he's a 2022 United States Artist Fellow. He had a solo exhibition at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York last fall. Uh, he also last fall had a collaboration with the Catalyst Quartet, um, uh, designing and performing in Baseline Fabulous, a modern take on Johann Sebastian Bach's Goldberg Variations at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So we have a really exciting panel of art historians and artists with us today, and I will turn it over, the, over to them to get us started. Uh, Mark, take it away. Oh, and I should say, as we get the PowerPoint loaded, feel free to put any questions that you have into the chat and we'll facilitate a discussion um, right after our speakers are done presenting. Unmute myself. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you um, for, for joining us. I'm delighted also to be here and to meet Virtually Machine and everybody else. Um, I'm, of course, uh, coming from you from Sydney. Uh, good morning from here. And of course, I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and would like to pay um, my respects and acknowledge elders past, present and future. And I also like to apologize briefly for the noise that you may hear, which is scaffolding being taken down just outside my office window here. So uh, many apologies in advance. So we left last uh, couple of weeks back in the full glory of Rococo's sort of exuberant heyday in the 1740s. And we gave indications even then though, of the kind of rejection that was coming of the exuberant aesthetic by a rather strategically virtuous enlightenment. But of course that only uh, intensified in the wake of a revolution that found uh, Rococo's excesses, not exciting, fluid and generative, but indicative of a corrupt order and entirely out of character with the Republic, especially um, uh, Robespierre's Republic 
of virtue, but a republic of equality, et cetera, et cetera. But Rococo, of course, didn't vanish. It went, let's say, underground. And in the course of what Francois Furet, the great French historian, described as the long revolutionary process, broadly, you know, 1770 to 17 to 1870, it survived as a series of pulses. But it's after the Franco-Prussian War and its disastrous outcomes that French thinkers and critics and aesthetes and artists and a newly gener a new generation of industrialists and new money started to re-engage with Rococo and the culture of Pompadour uh, and, and the aesthetic. And there are lots of reasons. And I, I want to start with two of the most influential of the thinkers who began to remap uh, Rococo and what it might mean. And that, of course, includes the Goncourt brothers, uh, Edmund and Jules, who began to excavate the lives, um, tastes, and the arts of, the, of particularly the mid 18th century. And their collection of essays on 18th century art, which is called L'Art du 18 e siècle, um, is really a sort of epoch making book in some ways because they did a lot of archival excavations, but they, they, they made arguments um, for the continuing uh, interest or the particular interest of 18th century art, particularly the Rococo, and the place of women in it as creators, as actors in, in, in the age. And, the pendant to their great uh, 18th century art was really their, um, uh, their monograph on Madame de Pompadour, which was first published in the 1870s, then expanded richly with new documents. And of course, it was really hard to get hold of proper documents about Pompadour. Everyone had invented most of it. Um, but they engaged um, uh, in, in serious uh, academic reconstruction of the 18th century. But at the same time, and if we can have the next slide, they uh, began to... Uh, oh, can I, can I, yeah, uh, they also adopted in their own personal environment, in their own personal circles, the taste and uh, uh, that they began to make Rococo taste fashionable again against a, a group of, in their various residences. This is um, Jules de Goncourt's own uh, watercolor of the decor of their, one of their, the, their early apartment, in fact. Um, and I think this is a very important moment because it's both an intellectual rediscovery, but it is also a taste-making aesthetic rediscovery. It's a moment when I would argue, and the Goncourt's are complex, but a kind of dandy, a queer subculture first begins to um, engage the Rococo. And if we think about how that subculture uh, took up Rococo along with, uh, you know, um, think of Whistler and Wilde and the Eastites and their mixing of Rococo objects with the famous blue china and Japonism to create a specifically kind of otherworldly and overwhelming in some ways spaces that re rejected what they saw as utilitarian and I would argue heteronormative uh, uh, sort of uh, taste. And Oscar Wilde, of course, is out in the United States in the 1880s preaching the house beautiful as part of a kind of personal uh, revolution. But this uh, if you go to the next slide, exquisite aestheticism, if you like, an exquisite Rococo might have horrified, uh, you know, uh, goes with a, a simultaneous movement from the 1870s and 80s, in which the grand new elites of the late 19th century, the industrialists, the banking barons, started to also uh, uh, sort of in explicit ways look back to the grand Rococo interiors of the 18th century. So that, for example, this is the, as you might recognize, is the uh, Oval Salon of the Jacquemart André Museum, which was a residence built uh, in the 1870s for um, the, uh, uh, the industrialist André and his artist wife, Nelly Jacquemart. And, uh, you know, with its, with its obvious um, sort of nods to the Hôtel de Soubise and other great uh, Rococo interiors. And then, uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, we also have, of course, in Britain, we, we have famously Wadston Manor, but here we also have the, the almost one of the most fanatical collectors and reassemblers of Rococo taste, which is uh, the, uh, the Marcus Hartford, and then following in particularly Richard Wallace. This you might recognize as the kind of Boucher Fest in the now Wallace collection. But remember that that collection is being built up in the 1870s through a series of amazing bidding wars where various uh, industrial and uh, banking barons tried to outcompete each other for all of those Sevres vases and all of those, uh, they became the, so that the Rococo became a kind of trophy of a certain kind of uh, high living, I'm afraid to say it, uh, one percenter culture, you might even argue. Um, but I think that at this, uh, another thing we should take, and I think one that will, um, I think, have more influence on what comes in the 20th 
and 21st century, if you go to the next slide, is that this, it wasn't just for the 1%, so to speak, because in the exploding print culture of the late 19th century and the early 20th century, certain figures, and I would definitely pick out the German uh, uh, sort of press uh, entrepreneur Georg Hirt, uh, started to rethink and readopt and uh, in his press magazines, including, you know, Bildenschatz, which is a, a, a Formenschatz, which is sort of was translated as art treasure. It was a popular magazine um, that was that through the medium of the of the illustrated press repopularized de designs and decor that had previously been sort of confined to the grand interiors of the uh, early 18th century. And I think there's a, I mean, there's a direct link then between this kind of rediscovery and what Hirt also does, which is create the magazine Jugend, the sort of art and lifestyle magazine, which gives its name to Jugendstil, which is how we, in the German speaking world, they understand Art Nouveau and the direct relationships between the, the creators who got excited by uh, seeing Rococo as a design idea and the uh, an Art Nouveau is very obvious, I think, if you just take my last slide, which um, is a sort of tale of teapots where uh, through various forms, the, um, the uh, both that, that, that sort of almost overflowing uh, sort of ludic playfulness of the Rococo, as you see in the uh, 1750s silver, uh, teapot we have uh, in the uh, top left, and the delicate floral, animal, organic form that had been so encapsulated in Rococo porcelain finds its way both in some ways into these rather extraordinary Art Nouveau um, experiments, uh, such as, of course, uh, the, the teapot you see on the right, which was uh, created for um, the uh, by Alphonse Desbains, which is you know known as the snail teapot for the Musée which is now in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris, and which was created for the Universal Exposition of 1900 and created a great splash there. So what I'm gonna leave you with this idea that Rococo might have seemed like a kind of retreat from modernity, but actually it was inspiring pulses of waves of the kind of people who were trying to engage with, a, with new forms of life that may, may themselves be alternate or, or uh, a new form of fluid modernity, but also objects and styles which became themselves part of the story of modernity. So I will, I will pass over to Melissa now. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to return to some of the, the themes that, that Mark has introduced. I mean, one thing I think will become evident from, from what all three of us have to say tonight is that, that there have been so there have been many so-called revivals of the Rococo at different moments since the 18th century through the 19th century, arguably into the present. And we've had to choose a, a few key examples that we could go on for much longer. So we're, we're showing you some highlights, but um, I think at the, at the same time, the fascination with, the interest in, the engagement with the Rococo has never really gone away. Marx described this as sort of pulses or waves of interest. Um, and that these engagements take varying forms and incur with different resonances and degrees of intensity at these moments when we have revivals. Um, so I'm returning us to the late 19th and early 20th century in the slides that I'm showing you here. Um, Marx talked about French and British examples, uh, but just to continue that idea about the art of the 1%, in some sense that the interest in um, the Rococo has uh, a tradition of being associated with elites and the aristocracy and so forth. Although, as we'll see, I think the multivalence of the of the mode is is very clear from all the different kinds of engagement that we see. But um, so people like industrials, finance, industrialists, financiers like Henry Clay Frick, we have him to thank for the for the Frick Museum in New York. Um, so that's to say, by upwardly mobile people, often new money, nouveau riche. For them, you know, people with social ambitions, the Rococo is a style that's associated with refinement and with the class, you know, sort of classiness of French culture. Um, and Anna Thompson Dodge, whose portrait I'm showing you here um, on, the, on the right, is a perfect example of that. She's born a, a poor Scottish immigrant and becomes the wife of the founder of Dodge Motors. After the death of her husband, she's one of the richest women in the world. She builds this fabulous mansion um, called Rose Terrace in Gross Point, uh, Michigan, inspired very modestly by Versailles. Um, and it was 
lavishly appointed with Louis XV or Rococo furnishings and art. And what I want to say about this particular portrait is that she's not just interested in the sort of cultural capital of the Rococo. Um, and I think, well, Meredith will touch on some of these things, these themes too, I think about the sort of aspirational class aspects of, um, of, of the Rococo, which is true to the origins of the style itself. But anyway, um, Mrs. Dodge had a particular affinity, as you can see in this portrait, for Madame de Pompadour herself. So it's not just about sort of collecting these 18th century things, but then in some sense she identifies as Madame de Pompadour. And uh, you see her in this, um, this portrait from 1932 uh, in the guise of Pompadour at work that's making very explicit reference to the portrait of Pompadour that's in the Wallace collection. We've already heard um, a little bit about the Wallace collection. And you see her magisterial portrait presiding uh, over the library. And um, the Rose Terrace, alas, was torn down in the 70s. It became derelict and is no longer, is no longer uh, in existence, although her possessions were dispersed across the country in, uh, in auctions. Um, Meredith, could we have the next slide? And one of the works that, um, that was in this, you know, the sale after her death is the uh, this huge scale uh, tapestry cartoon, one of a, of a pair that's now in the Getty Museum um, called the Bird Catchers. And it was purchased from probably the most famous dealer, art dealer in the world, Joseph Duveen, um, who was very instrumental in, you know, supplying and uh, these industrialists with uh, 18th century works of art and convincing them, I think, of their, of their, uh, the ways in which they would give them kind of cultural capital. But in any case, I was particularly interested to learn that Mrs. Dodge had owned this painting, the premise being that, uh, or on the assumption that it had belonged to Pompadour, the legend about it was that it had a gift to her from Louis XV, which it wasn't at all. But it is a work that, um, that does speak to some of the things we talked about last week about the sort of um, interchangeability of the figures. Boucher reuses some of the same models for male and female figures, which speaks to some of the, the themes from last week about that kind of playfulness and, and delight and gender ambiguity uh, in his work. Um, sort of continue with the, comp with the Pompadour thread, if we could go to the next, um, to the next slide. So this is a this is a big leap chronologically, but the, the unifying thread here is, uh, is Pompadour. And um, so we're here in the 1990s. I'm showing you a, a very different kind of engagement with Rococo and uh, and Pompadour, and one that was, I think, both celebratory and critical. Um, an engagement not by uh, or a sort of fascination with Pompadour, not on the part of a collector, but an artist. In this case, Cindy Sherman, who used photography to explore and critique questions of identity. You know, very much insisting on its contingency and its performative aspects. And in this work from 1992, she too evokes Pompadour, the title you can see covered Turin with Trey, Madame de Pompadour, Ne Poisson. And my slide's not great, but you can see in the, the cartouche of this flamboyantly pink Sèvres porcelain Turin that um, Sherman herself masquerades as Pompadour. She photographed herself in a wig with white makeup, prosthetic breasts, and so forth. And there's, you know, so much more we could say, but I would just say as a, just a little, in a nutshell that among other things that this is an image that that spoofs commodification of women as objects and of um, of male you know heterosexual male fascination and desire it does lots of other things as well but like for for one aspect of I think a kind of critical engagement with Rococo this is a, a, a good instance of that if we could go to the next one still continuing with Pompadour here the Pompadour theme and um, in the person of Vivian Westwood um, the um, fashion designer, probably familiar to everybody here, but um, Pompadour and the Rococo, particularly Boucher, uh, were key elements in Vivienne Westwood's fashion designs. And I'm here showing you one of the dresses that she designed for her fall winter line from 1995. So this is right around the time that, uh, that um, Cindy Sherman is making her, um, her, her Pompadour Tourine. But even before that, uh, if we could go to the next one, um, Westwood had taken a particular um, inspiration from Boucher in her now very iconic uh, Boucher corset on which she printed one of Boucher's pastoral paintings, also in the Wallace collection, another theme for the day, I guess, um, Daphnis and Chloe from uh, 1743. And the, the 
garment itself is the reinterpretation of a foundational garment of 18th century women's fashion, but it really subverted the course its original purpose, making an undergarment into outerwear and representing it as an emblem of female liberation. And so I'm interested in this in terms of the sort of theme of the subversive edge that one can find, uh, that many artists find, designers find in, um, in their engagement with the Rococo. And in, in Westwood's case, I mean, I think it makes complete sense um, that subversive edge when you take into account that she had begun her career as a key creative force in the punk movement of the 1970s. But I would say also such subversion is entirely in the spirit of the Rococo itself. And you know that her choice of a work by Boucher, this archetypal painter um, of, Boucher, of the Rococo to adorn the course that could not have been more apt. And you can see in the slide on the right that as recently as 2021, the year before she uh, before she died, she had gone back to Boucher, uh, as it were, with numerous items in her um, in her collection. So if we can go to the next one, just got a couple more slides to share with you here. So I mean, my, many of the most serious and thoughtful contemporary artists who have explicitly engaged with uh, Rococo aesthetics, with Boucher, with Pompadour, and in this case Fragonard. They have adopted a, a point of view um, of social or, or cultural critique, or have at least engaged with the Rococo in, um, with a kind of ironic and critical distance. Um, and some who, who seek to, uh, who adopt the Rococo seek to queer, to make race visible or to undermine or question history. There are these various ways in which um, they, I think, um, use the Rococo to do that. And, and, Nika Shonabari's um, swing after Fragonard that I'm showing you on the left, there's a perfect example of that, where you have these beautiful but sinister uh, recreations of Rococo paintings that are populated by figures that call to mind oversized uh, mice and porcelain figure figurines without their heads. Uh, these can be read very much as part of his critique of colonial excess and luxury. You have these cavorting um, couples, in this case, the, the man is left out of the scene, but there are others where you have um, couples both represented, but cavorting, cavorting couples, swinging women of uh, Boucher and Fragonard that are already condemned to their violent ed, end without their, without their heads. So, you know, in, in works like this, the French Coco, Rococo, I think, is an uh, kind of object of critique for its frivolous luxury, its artifice and its inattention to the injustice and, and disparities, violence of its age. And yet at the same time, these artists are very careful attention to and investment in the seductive qualities of fabric and color and the mood of their models. These all speak to some of the ways in which um, Rococo has been deployed to subvert, to surprise, to challenge, to thwart conventional expectations um, about gender and sexuality, about race as well. And I think to an extent, we might argue that even um, that in the context of such critiques of familiar Rococo tropes, um, the generative permissive nature of this aesthetic very much um, emerges. So I, I guess what I'm saying, there's this uh, way in which an, a contemporary artists, I think very often See, are involved in critique of the Rococo. At the same time, they're also in, uh, engaged with it so deeply. There's a kind of delight in, you know, the excesses in painterliness, in you know, ornament, all kinds of levels in which, um, you know, they they love the Rococo, but also can see that it has a critical side, or they can be critical of it at the same time. Um, that's something we could talk more about. But um, my last example, if we could just go to my last slide here, is to talk a little bit about these, what Mark and I in our essay talk about as the, the fluid animating possibilities of the Rococo that are um, equally productively felt in the work of feminist, queer, and dissenting artists from a number of modern, you know, more um, of modern traditions and, and um, in, in recent years. These include familiar names actually going back, these are the ones we haven't been able to talk about with you, but Florine Stettheimer, Andy Warhol, Cindy Sherman, I showed you, as well as newcomers um, like the, the painter Flora Yuknovich. And she's an artist who has really found inspiration in the work of Rococo painters that has led to what she describes as a liberation of her painterly sensibilities. So her painting, in her painting, there's this delight in the material and visual pleasures of paint and on the painterly trace and color especially in Tristan Pink and its relationship to 
um, femininity and the female body in representation. And I would, at the same time, I would categorize Flora as making common cause with the persuasive work of many feminist um, historians of art, particularly historians of Rococo painting, who've shown that Rococo um, sensibility and eroticism that embraces materiality and touch and gesture can really be understood to undercut and to um, subvert scopophilic or patriarchal fantasies that objectify the female body, so as, as well as um, oppressive gender and, and sexual norms. So in other words, I think one of the things that's going on in her work is the use of abstraction and the materiality of paint itself to undercut or thwart the objectification of the female body. Um, so I think I'll stop there in the interest of, uh, of time and hand things over to, um, to Meredith. Thank you, Melissa. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, so I'm gonna just pick up on a few of the themes that Mark and Melissa already spoke about and maybe reintroduce um, a few additional themes and artists, and then we can kind of move into a conversation with each other and with Machine and with um, the audience, uh, time permitting. And so I think this idea of, um, you know, the persistence of the Rococo and also it's kind of shape-shifting quality, you know, it's ability to sort of prop up or to legitimate, you know, those on top of the economic hierarchy or the 1%, but also to kind of subvert, um, you know, restrictive, hierarchies, whether they're class, gender, racial um, hierarchies is is really important. And I think also what Melissa just said earlier about, I'm, I'm gonna turn here briefly and sort of obviously to the idea of the kind of Rococo and the sort of possibility of uh, the expression of female feminine identity um, and also kind of connection to, to female liberation. Um, but then sort of also the way that the Rococo can engage with a kind of patriarchal system in, in which women are kind of trapped and pinned, you know, sort of subjected to the male gaze. And I think Sofia Coppola's, actually her trilogy of films, the one of Marie Antoinette is probably, is obviously, you know, the one that's most closely connected historically and perhaps aesthetically to the Rococo and the Neo-Rococo. But I think Marie Antoinette really has to be seen in line with her other two films about sort of young women you know, trapped in these claustrophobic uh, situations and, you know, under the scrutiny of the male gaze, uh, be it the virgin suicides or, or lost in translation. And I think she's using kind of Sofia Coppola sort of mobilizing the Rococo here to really um, try to connect to the past, um, to this historical figure in particular, um, to create a sense of kind of um, intimacy, to make a film that's about gazing, you know, women looking at other women and being connected to um, other women. Um, there's in some sense a kind of use of very um, proper you know period costumes and settings they they film at versailles but then there's also the introduction of these quite obvious sort of historical anachronisms these kind of breaks you know in this in the seam of historical reconstruction the manola blonic you know shoes for instance which i think is a way of trying to get at a kind of you know connect to the past to make it sort of relevant and meaningful to the present but also to, to create a kind of a sort of authenticity you know that's that's not the sort of historical pastiche but that still can have people you know younger women audiences, anyone who loves this film, not only, you know, not just women, but to um, to connect to this figure and to kind of, you know, see something in this in this film. And I think um, you could connect or compare that aesthetic to Elizabeth Payton's series of um, paintings after artists like Vigie Lebrun, Marie Antoinette's favorite portrait painter. This is Payton's Marie after Vigie Lebrun. There's a kind of obvious sort of um, link here and this historical, this, the way in which the Rococo is kind of mediated through a variety of different filters and it comes to us almost through this kind of like sepia veil and you know a sort of acknowledgement of the way in which we may access this historical phenomenon you know not so much through images paintings from the 18th century but through maybe Sofia Coppola's kind of interpretation of the 18th century and I think that idea of mediation is something that a lot of contemporary artists are are thinking about um, of course there's also the culture of excess the aesthetics of excess that's very obvious in Coppola's film um, and again, just to kind of continue this issue of, of identity and how the Rococo becomes this kind of liberating um, aesthetic, you know, because it's it's always seen to kind of subvert, you know, the, break the rules, whether it's the rules of academic history painting or just academic traditions. And, and because of its kind of capacious um, ability to, you know, enable a lot of different people to, to speak and to express identity and particularly marginalized um, identities. And I think that's the appeal for an artist like Salman Tour, who had an exhibition at the Whitney in New York a couple of years ago um, and who's shown here in his studio on the left and then with a painting uh, by him in the, the center called The Star from 2019 in the shape of this kind of intimate sort of spiritual tondo 
painting. It's it's quite small. And I think what Melissa was saying about the sense of touch and materiality, it kind of begs you to get closer and, and to look at it. Um, that's a very proper, there's a aesthetic theorist of the Rococo, Regis de Pie, who says that, you know, the purpose of art is not to teach a moral lesson, um, you know, to be didactic, but rather to kind of seduce the spectator, to call out, you know, and ask him or her to sort of approach the figures as if you're having a conversation. And I think what Tor really wants to express um, what he calls a sort of queer brown identity, sexuality, um, desire and love, you know, which relates to his own experience, you know, growing up in, in Pakistan, um, being fascinated with, as he says, with his grandmother's sort of Gainsborough prints, again, kind of the mediated Rococo with artists, intimate artists exploring themes of love and identity, but usually heteronormative. Um, subject matter, you know, artists like Longhi or Vateau, and then now working in his studio in New York and to try to kind of make that um, that sense of, of intimacy and desire his own for himself and, um, you know, sort of for the community that he wants to represent. And I just brought in one uh, Rococo painting, uh, Jean-Francois de Troyes Before the Ball from 1735, because I think there's a lot of interesting parallels in terms of the, the intimacy, the sense of connection, of touch, of, of paint, but also of sort of bodies moving closely to one another. And this idea of kind of this excitement of getting ready to, to go out. But here you have a group of men um, sort of making up, you know, someone's face and hairspray and kind of getting out for a night on the town in this sort of lovely pink um, shirt um, that this figure is wearing. And the reflection in the mirror, also this sense of kind of um, self-reflection uh, is, is a theme as well. Um, this is also this exploration of identity um, and of queerness is also a really important aspect of um, the artist Matt Smith's work, who he works um, with ceramics, with sculpture, um, now more with print, 3D printing. And also he uses, kind of mobilizes the language of the Rococo porcelain figurine um, for a form of, of institutional critique. And this is, he's done a number of different shows, a number of different interventions in several museum spaces, primarily in the UK. And this is one example of a, um, a, an installation he did called Queering the Museum at the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, in which he um, installed some of his own figures representing famous queer couples in history, like the ladies of Langolan, um, in these um, sort of 18th century porcelain display cases, or this figure looks like a kind of Pierrot on the, on the left, next to an actual 18th century porcelain. So on the right, you have the, the man sort of standing, a Smith creation, and then a, a figure is supposed to be a kind of shepherd boy. And um, for Matt's in interested in the ways in which oftentimes perhaps without even thinking of it, but you know, museum installers will put the shepherd with the shepherdess and create this kind of like heteronormative relationship, which is also apparent in paintings by artists like Boucher, although as Melissa has, has written and as she mentioned, you know, that kind of gender ambiguity is sometimes, sometimes present there. But what um, Matt Smith wants to do is to kind of decouple, you know, to take this you know, heterosexual couple apart and turn the shepherd into a gay cruiser. And so he kind of puts him on the case in a particular way. And, and through that kind of tries to make a point about, you know, the absence of certain kinds of desire, certain kinds of identity as they're represented in the museum and how the museum consciously or unconsciously sort of reproduces this kind of heteronormative discourse and, and wanting to, to disrupt it in his own very playful and uh, wonderfully humorous way. And then the last artist I want to mention before we um, turn to talking about Machine Dazzle's work and, and the Remo production is actually an artist. This is a kind of wonderful. You know, the Rococo is constantly fresh and new. It was called Le Gumo Down in the 18th century. And this is an artist that I just came to know about um, two days ago. And of all places, I was down in Bentonville, Arkansas, to, uh, visiting the Crystal Bridges Museum and their wonderful contemporary art space called the Momentary. You know, get on a plane and go to Bentonville. And I think the Momentary is a kind of perfect Rococo uh, name. And it also used to be, this is an industrial space that's been repurposed as a contemporary gallery, but it used to be a um, craft macaroni and cheese uh, production facility. But anyway, um, Yvette Mayorga is a Mexican-American artist who now works in Chicago and who very much kind of deploys the, the language of the Rococo and particularly of uh, work by Boucher. And this is a couple of um, uh, installation views from her show, which is up right now, um, which is called What a Time to Be. And it's based on a body of work that she made during the pandemic um, in which she asked members of her family from whom she was separated to send her photos of themselves. And then she created these kinds of Neo Rococo, you know, photo collages um, inspired by artworks and paintings by Boucher, and then puts them throughout the gallery space. And I'll talk a little bit about her very distinctive aesthetic, but you can see in a couple of details down here this, this sort of metallic sheen that she has on, on her painted surfaces, and also this very thickly sort of built up um, 
paint, which is um, done with a really complicated technique of um, acrylic paint that's based on cake piping. So it's connected to her own sort of childhood, the panaderia, the confectionaries of, of um, New Mexican American culture. But I think, you know, the pink, the sweet, the feminine, you know, it's very much um, connected to the Rococo or what she calls Latin X Oco. Um, and which for her is connected to, she, she links in the wall text for this exhibition, the Rococo to the American dream. Um, and she says that, you know, the Rococo becomes a reference for the desire of attaining a higher class status after migration. Um, its residues are found in the home and clothing and cakes and celebration, residues of, of colonialism. So I think she speaks to the way of, you know, for, for herself as an artist, for other, you know, we went all the way back to Anna Thompson and the sort of idea of, you know, immigration of social um, cultural aspiration. But I think that, that for her own Mexican-American culture and heritage, you know, this is a way to kind of um, express that uh, very powerfully. And I just, you know, one of her pieces of these, these figures who are dangling from the wall are actually directly inspired by the two Boucher paintings that Mark mentioned, you know, the rising and the setting of the sun in the Wallace collection. And then I just wanted to show you one uh, work by her that is, you know, directly connected to a work that we discussed last, last week that Melissa introduced, um, Francois Boucher's portrait of Madame de Pompadour the Munich portrait from 1756, but which in Yvette Mayorga's sort of uh, neo-Rococo aesthetic becomes this kind of wonderful, almost sort of a cake topper. It's it's based on a collage of her sister. Just get a little sense of that, that incredibly, you know, that heavy sort of um, icing detail. And then I'll show you, uh, this is what it's connected to, this photo collage that she made. And then there's the original source. And here's a detail and you can see her sister with the phone in her hand. And again, the kind of cell phone, that idea of sort of this image culture and the Rococo kind of coming to us through all of these different pop cultural references, you know, kind of resisting high and low categories, the celebration of, of kitsch, the sense of a kind of reflection. There's a, um, a Chicana cult cultural critic, um, Amalia Mesa Barnes, who talks about this aesthetic of domesticada, which is really important, you know, for a number of different um, artists who are trying to kind of subvert these categories of high and low, but also sort of restricted gender norms. And I think that's that's relevant to this to this work as well. But there's also a little bit of a dark side, a bit of humor. Um, this is a quote that I uh, took from the wall text um, from uh, Mayarga herself. You know, she asked her sister to send her a, a, a picture at the peak of the pandemic, and she showed up, you know, wearing leopard print pajamas, tilting her head like Madame de Pompadour. Um, it's radical resistance to lay in your leopard print PJs and doom scroll on your phone while the world collapses. <laughs> so I think, you know, that also, I think my is also tapping a little bit into the idea of the Rococo as a kind of escapist fantasy, you know, as much as it's able to kind of express a certain cultural identity and a certain, you know, resistance kind of politics at particular moments, you know, sometimes you also just want to order fake nails from Amazon and, you know, doom scroll on your phone while, <laughs> while things fall apart economically or, or otherwise. Um, okay, I think we're going to now move on. Um, I have just, I brought in a couple of installation uh, shots from the wonderful Queer Maximalism and Machine Dazzle exhibition that I saw at the Museum of Art and Design uh, about a month ago. These are some sort of crappy photos I took with my own iPhone. But, you know, these are the, the, the images that to me really kind of um, you know, engage with certain aspects of, of the Rococo, either in terms of the, the, the color scheme, the kind of aesthetics of excess, um, you know, this sort of sense of like touch and materiality, you really wanted to get up and kind of, you know, touch this, this tool and, and balloons and, and then of course like the, the silhouette and some gilding and candles. But I think there's also a way in which, you know, neo-Rococo artists don't necessarily have to reference the Rococo directly. You know, sometimes there's a kind of structural or a conceptual link, um, you know, whether it's to ideas about desire, intimacy, you know, what have you. So I just wanted to kind of um, turn it over to, to Machine Dazzle and, I guess to start by asking, um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your uh, the production that you're working on, or if you just like to respond to what we've what we've said, and and you know to to sort of say a bit about whether any of these artists, any of this work, or any of these kinds of ideas that you see it sort of resonating with your own practice. Oh, thank you, um, Meredith, and um, also Melissa and Mark. I uh, I. I've always loved Rococo in terms of aesthetic. Um, in fact, Fragonard's The Swing is, I love that painting. Why do I love the painting? Because I wanted to be her swinging in that moment, um, which is probably might be completely opposite of you know, the intent um, of uh, you know, the painting um, in terms of, you know, 
societal hierarchical issues. Um, I will say that, um, I guess I could preface this whole thing by saying that, you know, the high heel can be oppressive to women, but when a man puts it on, it's liberation. And that's kind of maybe a perfect foundation from where I build my costumes. Um, I, I love big things. Um, I love wearing ideas. I'm a storyteller. Um, there's a reason for everything. Um, so essentially all of my costumes are layers and layers of ideas. I am storytelling. Um, it's, there's aesthetic there because uh, I choose to tell the story in a certain way <laughs> and I love big. Um, my, my real uh, costume practice comes from um, just participating in public events like let's say gay pride parade or the Easter bonnet parade or the mermaid parade or even Halloween and uh, growing up the way that I did um, in very conservative places, I wasn't really allowed to be who I was. And so as soon as I became an adult and moved to New York, <laughs> I had a whole reserve of ideas um, and dreams that I wanted to realize. And uh, just, I don't know, moment to moment, um, there I am finding myself on the street and, um, you know, they say that the street is a theater in a way that, you know, that this life is a life is a show and you're the star of your own show, you know? And, uh, and so when you go out onto the street and you do this, you are creating space for yourself. Um, in my case, I am creating queer space that isn't really just given to me. Um, it's not just made for me. You have to go out and make queer space. And when you do it large, I mean, uh, you can show up and your costume can not only be the costume, it can be the props, it can be like the whole set. As soon as someone walks into a space wearing this, you're changing someone's life, you're changing what costume is, you're changing what's possible. And, uh, and I think that's really what it is. Um, uh, I know that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. <laughs> I'm happy to explain any of that. Uh, but uh, what else did I wanna say? I was taking notes this whole time. I'm really interested in breaking forms. Um, yeah, so that image on the right, um, it just so happens the, this is a, these are both costumes from uh, Taylor Mac 24 decade history of popular music. Uh, the one on the right is, uh, this is the fourth hour of the show, just in case you don't know, um, it was a 24 hour show. Um, and we started in 1776, uh, end of the American Revolution, uh, 4th of July. Um, and we, um, and every decade is an hour. And so uh, every hour we focus on a different, uh, we focus on a different, uh, a group of people that's fostering community because they're being torn apart. Um, there's a lot to this. Um, I will say that uh, <laughs> before, so every there, like I said, there's reasons for everything, but the image on the right, this was um, songs popular in the heteronormative narrative. You know, it happened early in the show. We had to like, you know, just do it and acknowledge it. <laughs> um, I will say that the, the image on the right leads to the image on the left. Um, of course, there's always like the men are going off to war and always leaving the women alone. And there's this whole thing about, you know, three sisters and one of them is the fairest of them all. And, you know, the other one isn't the fairest of them all. And when you're not the fairest of them all, bad things happen to you. And, you know, uh, you know so you're playing with gender and, um, and just these old stories that really just don't serve us anymore. And so there I was, I mean, to me, that was the better. I mean, Taylor was literally wearing the wall with the portraits and the sconces. Um, and yeah, and uh, uh, and there's like, there's a little male and female, there's like the little, what represents a heteronormative narrative of a lock and a key. Oh, and uh, you know, but I tried to like, you know, make it kind of fun. There's like this fun baby doll dress and there's this um, teddy bear, golden teddy bear, um, you know, hooked on with like this big clamp, let's say. Um, pearl necklace, little box of chocolates, tassels, because they're so fun and um, all of that stuff. Um, I will say now on the image on the left, 
Um, <laughs> this is like the literally the decade right afterwards. Um, this was the decade that um, we blindfolded the audience. Uh, so they were blindfolded for an hour. And um, throughout that hour, um, I was taking all of the pieces of the previous costume off, all of those pieces that you see on the right, taking them off and slowly putting Taylor into this costume. And then Taylor was in a harness and then lifted like 15 feet off of the air. And I created this huge, in the show, it's actually three times as big, three times as many balloons. And me and um, another dandy minion, Timothy White Eagle, were on either side, like holding up the balloons. And when people took their blindfolds off after an hour, um, there was this beautiful soft spotlight on Taylor, like in air. And what I wanted was the most beautiful and understandable and just like healing maybe, and you know, costume. I wanted the most beautiful and opulent costume to not be seen by, by the audience. I just, I love that. I mean, and I will say that there isn't a lot going on. Um, there's so much conceptually going on on the right. There's not a lot conceptually going on on the left, um, but it's, you know, it's really pleasant to look at. And I have to say it was the most, this was probably the most photographed costume in my entire exhibit. It was up for six months. This came across my feed every day. I'm like, wow, yes, it's very, very beautiful. But I mean, I find beauty really easy to achieve and even easier to understand but we are drawn to it anyway. Um, so anyway, I dealt with it and we'll just look at it. Anyway, um, I do love the tool and the balloons. And actually that was, this was like a while ago. You can see how the balloons have shrunk inside of their tool little um, compartments there. So just so you know, like this was uh, after a few months for sure. Anyway, I know I tend to ramble. No, 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 that's wonderful. I should have put them in different in order though, but I think that's okay that we went. Oh, no, it's okay. You didn't know. Um, one of the things you mentioned, um, Machine, I, you, you talk about it fun and and one of the things we hadn't talked about a lot, but Meredith started to refer to a few times is is humor and and this and we did the subversive possibilities of humor. And and you know, you 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 would exude that as as well as uh, the the moving nature of so much of what you do, and I I wondered whether um, how you how you look at humor, and I you know yesterday I was in New York and saw the Gio, and there's a very funny painting uh, from the early 18th century about um, uh, Helen abducting Paris, not Paris abducting Helen, and 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 Paris is in this. Pierrot costume and looking like oh my god I'm being taken away and it's just it's um it it's just it's just fun and funny and it's from the early 18th century and and that's um that's a lot of what brings us in I think and to to learn so much more is that is that nature and I wonder if you if that's something you're conscious you use consciously or or uh, oh. very much um I love humor um I've La laughter is healing. And um, it was Joan Rivers who said, you know, we can make anything funny, even serious things. We need to laugh more. Um, laughter is healing. And I use it in my work. I love making very outrageous things. Um, I love making like completely like, like, what is that? I feel like if a, a performer walks out on stage and the audience isn't questioning the outfit a little bit, I feel like I've definitely failed. Um, <laughs> at least I failed myself. I'm like, I want the audience to be like, what is that? And I like there to be like little surprises, like, oh my God, like, are you kidding? <laughs> is this is like really happening in front of, you know. Yeah, um, our, our Rameau helps you in that everybody's in disguise too. So I have to tell you, I'm so happy with this, this Rameau piece because it, it, first of all, it is funny. And, um, and I'm just having such a great time creating uh, costumes for this, this wonderful cast. Um, because it's like, it's, it's a funny, uh, there's a lot of humor in it. And I think just the more outrageous everything is, the better. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And anyway. all the big, all the big wigs, like the big uh, uh, j gods, have to have to dress up in in disguise before they reveal themselves. And it's it, it's true. Well, they have to, but it has to be. I mean, I do love beautiful things, 
but I love interesting things the most. Um, I like there to be a story. It's like, oh, where, what is it? You know, what is it? I mean, I guarantee you there is a reason for everything, but sometimes I, I love to make emotions uh, wearable. I like to make uh, concepts wearable, ideas wearable. Um, uh, this is my friend Ashton on the far left. Uh, this is a shot from uh, my show Treasure. Uh, Guggenheim Works in Process commissioned me to do a show back in 2019, and um, it happens during Fashion Week um, in September of 2019. And uh, I did a rock and roll cabaret. Um, I'm a musician, I write songs, and I have a band. And uh, they were all about my mother, my relationship with her, and my self actualization. Um, and I had a, a like a twelve person uh, fashion show in the middle of in the middle of the whole show while I went to go take a do a you know a bathroom break, a powder my nose and change my costume. Uh, there was a twelve person fashion show happening, and all of the costumes uh, helped tell the stories that I was telling in my songs. Uh, there's a lot going on in this costume. <laughs> um, we can start at the top where. Uh, you know, that's like a mountain lion. There's like, we moved around a lot, um, uh, going west and, you know, you know, nature um, as, uh, you know, dangerous nature, beauty being dangerous, things like that. Um, there's coral, a uh, fan coral in there. There was a lot of water, stories about water. My parents grew up on the coast. Um, a lot of uh, things happened just in my life around like water. Um, there's like, there's like the Michael Jackson jacket. Um, which goes back to one of my favorite stories about my mother in like 1980. Um, my father was out like working like months, months at a time far away. And my mother was raising me and my brothers and she knew she, we wanted, she, me and my brothers wanted to go see the Jackson's victory tour. And it came through Houston and it was at the Astrodome, which doesn't exist anymore. And um, so my mom got tickets and going into downtown, uh, Houston in 1980 is just something that you didn't do if you're like from the suburbs but my mom did it and she got her hair done it was all feathered and she took me and my two brothers to JC Penney's and she got us all parachute pants and matching shirts and little studded jacket ja uh, little studded belts and like wristbands and we went and saw the Jacksons and I just I just love that story and then of course my obsession with Xanadu um, which really helped for me as a, an artist. Um, it's very underrated and it's an amazing soundtrack and it's really just, oh, there's so much creativity in it. You have to just go back and look at it. We screened it for my 50th birthday back in December. Um, so it's like electric. I mean, oh my God, like leg warmers, yes. High heels, there it is. Um, and then uh, we moved around a lot. And uh, so all of the models had luggage. Um, and there was like a planet theme. How far away can you run from your problems? How far away can you move until the grass is greener? So that lets you know how I make costumes. Everything that Ashton is wearing is a story. Um, and that's what I love. And the middle, the middle picture, this is Taylor Mac. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't go down any further with this one. Well, not necessarily. I mean, there's a, only because there is some explicit erotica on the lower half of the costume, but we're not looking at that right now. Um, in this particular decade, which was, I think it was like 1850, we were, uh, we were uh, going back and forth between um, who's the father of American song, um, Walt Whitman, or Stephen Foster. Stephen Foster is considered the father of American song, except you know he's, you know, writing minstrel songs and stuff like that, and you know, you know, do da do da. Anyway, but we champion Walt Whitman. Um, he's still someone who's still controversial to this day. Um, radically queer and just uh, I don't know. So you know, you see like there's the game. There's little chess pieces there, and like the you know the you know, just the, the high contrast. And of course, Walt Whitman is like nature and erotica and um, beautiful things, um, emotional things, um, deep things. Um, there's nothing deep about Stephen Foster. Anyway. One and, of the things uh, last, last week, Meredith talked a lot about nature and animating objects and animating nature. And, and that's so much a, a part of our opera too, is, is the way um, it, nature comes alive. I, do, you, do you wanna 
talk a little about about how, how you make that work or and and how that works for you um nature has all of the answers um in a macrocosm and in a microcosm look out look out into the sky look into limitless ideas um you have a question nature has the answer um even in microscopic forms uh, do you have a design problem look to nature nature has the answer <laughs> that's how i feel i love nature i love flowers i love dead flowers um i love animals i love water um i love how sand dunes and clouds and ocean waves um all look the same um the veins in a leaf are the same as like <clears throat> veins in the human body um i love uh I don't know. I, I'm along for that ride and uh, it helps me design. And yes, there's nature. <laughs> We're dealing with a few natural uh, things in um, our production. Um, and I think that whole is, you know, more is more, I think is is very much sort of in keeping with the spirit of, of Remo and of this production and also the connection to Ovid and the metamorphosis, you know, this capacity for transformation. You know, I have to more actually is more you're cheating yourself um i uh we exist actually in a maximalist society we are not only you might be in your head but there's so much happening around you that is actually part of your story right now i am sitting in a building i'm sitting in a chair i'm, I'm looking at all of you but I'm surrounded by this ether. Um, there's people all around me. They're on the other side of the walls, but they all have stories. <laughs> they all have lives that I might be familiar with or not. Um, someone's playing music. There are probably a hundred people playing music right now. Um, there's a window over there. Everything's happening. Um, it's all part of the experience. It's all part of what you can bring into a production. Uh, theaters can seem very, you know, you go inside and it's very protected and it's all very controlled. Um, I think it's interesting to have a little danger on stage and lose control a little bit and have things that, you know, actually happen in nature. Yes, you're walking down the street and birds happen. A plastic bag blows in your face. Um, someone's having an argument. Um, you know, I don't know, there's garbage over there. Um, there's a, a gaggle of you know, kids walking by and they're loud and annoying. And um, there's, there's people like making out over there. It's like, wow. It's like all of these things influence how I think about everything because every object, every costume, uh, you know, everything, everything, there's, there's so much more going on than only this. It's so interesting to me that that that, that herb, you know you're you're an urban artist in the sense of so many possibilities came came to you by coming to New York, you know, and 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 yet um and yet we're nature in throughout the Rococo way back to the 18th century is is so de bringing bringing nature is Rococo brings in nature and and just um, does does huge things with it. So, it brings in nature, yeah. but you know we are. Uh, what we're doing as a human race, we are one of nature's vicious cycles that's ravaging the earth. And nature is letting us get away with it. Now, don't get me wrong, nature bats last. And when she's ready, <laughs> you know, she'll be ready. But uh, we're creating our own nature. We're not importing plastic from outer space. Plastic is 99% fossil fuels. It's natural. I'm just saying, we're changing what? the earth's surface. Um, we're making our own nature. Um, well, it's, I, I'm not, trust me, I don't like plastic in the oceans. I'm not advocating. Um, but I, I, this is something I think about often. Um, you know, I, on a daily basis, um, I love natural fiber on my skin. I love cotton. I love linen. Um, when I'm on stage, I'm probably wearing sequins and some kind of a weird lame and like acrylic and stretchy, ooh, stuff that is not um, of the body. but stuff that we have turned earth into this thing. Um, anyway, I, it's it's stuff I think about. I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of love everything. 
Oh well, my then, God, it's seven o'clock. Yeah, well, that's well, that's a, that's a wonderful. That's the best sentiment. And I don't know whether Mark or or um, Melissa, who we won't see next week in person, the way we'll see uh, Meredith and you at the at Theof on on um, Wednesday. Wednesday? No, it's yeah, Wednesday night. Wednesday. Uh, for any of you who are in New York, please come, please come join us uh, and Machine and 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 Meredith and I and a few musicians in in person. Um, but uh, uh, but this has been great. Mark, do you want Melissa? Do you want to have a last word? Go ahead, Mark. No, uh, all I want to say is, first of all, thank you to everyone for listening. And uh, I mean, there are so many things that she was saying that go back to certain principles of kind of metamorphosis and also natural forms as come somehow both inspirational and uncontainable in uh, in early Rococo art in a way that I think is, is extremely useful, but also uh, provokes questions, you know, about excess and the problem of excess. And those questions of excess were key questions for 18th century thinkers, as well as for um, uh, our own age, you know, what is, what is maximal? What is, what is too much? What is too much? What is, uh, you know, and, and in a way, I, it's, it, I don't think we're going to solve those in, in the last minute of our discussion, but it is very useful. To, it's not just forms, but ideas, conflict, conflict and problems that endure. The, the Rococo is magnificent, but provokes issues, problems, thoughts, and even dilemmas that we're still um, dealing with now. Melissa, you want to add to that? Uh, well, I, I completely, I, I, I completely concur with Mark. I have a much less profound thing to say uh, by way of thank you and goodbye. But I would just say that I think that the swing invites everyone to identify with that woman in the pink dress. So I think you are right on the mark about. <laughs> about what that painting that at least that's one possible way of understanding that picture not just being the one looking at her but identifying with the you know the joy and delight of being on the swing so I think you and it can be and it can be subversive too yesterday at the, at the Cooper Hewitt they're putting seesaws across the wall in or pictures of the of the people who are doing pink seesaws across the wall the border wall and between the Ciudad de Juarez and and uh, El Paso it's just a beautiful thing to see so yeah, but thank you very much. This was great fun. And uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm sorry. Thanks, we'll Melissa. Miss... Thanks, Mark. I know you both have to go. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. And you thank next you week. so much for joining us. And we hope to see you next or two weeks from now on the 29th for our last session of this salon series hosted by Hetty Law and Rebecca Harris Work. We go to dance. We talk about dance. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good All night, right. everybody. Bye. Bye and thanks.